Have we started Adobe Connect, though? Yes, OK. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to the first campus-wide leadership series event of the year. Uh, we are on for today, February 3rd, then March 2nd, April 6th, and May 4th, all first Fridays. And uh, as always, there's a uh, survey at the end for you to fill out, and we certainly like your comments on speakers you'd like to see, topics you'd like to hear in the future. So starting out, uh, we have a lot of people to thank. The series is presented by the School of Nursing, School of Medicine, School of Health Professions, Graduate Studies, KU Hospital, University of Kansas Physicians, Continuing Education, and uh, HR. And I guess it's sponsored by PUDFA. That's Professional Development and Faculty Affairs. I'm the Associate Dean for PUDFA. No you, just PDFA. And um, I'm Bob Klein. Uh, also sponsored by Continuing Education. None of the speakers have anything to disclose today, which is always a good thing. And this is our first time with Adobe Connect. And uh, I think I was supposed to see something up here, wasn't I? Are people logging in? No, I'm not supposed to see it. OK, we see it's new. Uh, what it allows you to do if you can't come and we'd like you to show up, it's better. We have interaction and you get lunch. Uh, but uh, if you're unable to do so and it's, it's a session that's really interesting to you, Adobe Connect will allow you to connect from your desktop. And uh, it's very cool technology. Uh, people will be able to type in their questions and uh, we can interact with our remote sites. And KU has more and more of those uh, as we expand, which is a good thing. Going to uh, introduce our moderator for today, and then I get out of the way. Uh, Jim Dugan, Dr. Dugan, is a psychologist, counseling and educational support services. Uh, he asked me to mention that he's been slacking off and has not been at Kermeyer as frequently as he should, so you need to encourage him uh, to, to do that. Dr. Dugan. Can you hear me? Each of us are asked to be leaders at some point, whether it's in the operating room or leading patients through our corridors. I think leadership is really directly related to the quality of patient care we provide here and to our student outcomes. So the, what we did, we selected three of our outstanding leaders from our many outstanding leaders here at KU, and we thought that if they told you the mechanics, the, the tricks of the trade of leadership, we could walk away with one or two good ideas that we could take back to our work with the, with the people that we work with and kind of implement those ideas. So we're looking forward to hearing their comments, but also your discussion, your questions, asking them how they do it, uh, how they get the results that they get. So I'm very pleased our first speaker is our newest staff member here, Chris Lyon. Chris is uh, Associate Vice Chancellor for Administration and Human Resources. He is an attorney. And he is a graduate of, undergraduate at Fordham University in New York. He matriculated to California and attended law school at Loyola University there. He's had various positions in throughout the, uh, he's a Air Force, he was a staff judge in the Air Force. He was uh, working with one of the regulatory organizations in Washington, D.C. More recently, he has been the human resource director for the Kansas City Public School District before coming to KU. I know Chris a little and just some contacts I had with him and his accomplishments. He seems to blend that kind of high art, you know, knowing the technical stuff, but also the non-technical stuff, the people skills and how you translate that into work with all of us here. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce, introduce you to Chris Lyons. I'm all rigged up. Thank you very much. Is my microphone sounds like it's working. Great. Um, I just need my slides. Advance it is just okay. 
Well, thank you very much for that introduction. I'm Chris Lyon, and uh, I just recently celebrated my year anniversary here with the organization. Uh, no flowers, no candy, no cake. I'm not really sure what happened, but <laughs> I'll be looking forward to my 24-month anniversary with you, all of you. Um, this is a little bit about my background. I am a former military officer. I was an assistant staff judge advocate in the Air Force. You can see me here looking uh, devilishly handsome in a battle dress uniform in front of an A-10. Um, I also served as an employment attorney and HR advisor for the federal government and then moved myself to private industry where I worked for a little company called AOL and also what brought me here to the Kansas City area, Farmers Insurance. Uh, spent a couple of years also across State Line Road in K-12 education supporting the Kansas City, Missouri School District and that's what led me here to higher ed and I'm very, very happy to be here at KU. Uh, and I do caution you, I am a UConn Huskies fan for basketball, but I just want you to all know Jayhawks are my second favorite team. Uh, one of the things that I learned in my time in the Air Force, uh, well, let's just do a pop quiz. You know, this is, this is an educational setting, right? So who thinks as a, as a supervisor or a manager in an organization you should treat everyone exactly the same way? Be consistent with how you treat your employees. Show of hands. Excellent, excellent. That is a real, real myth. And what, I, what I'm going to use to sort of explode that myth, and this is one of the only slides I'm going to camp out on here during the course of my talk. I've got nine slides, and uh, this one we're going to spend about two minutes on. This is um, what you might recognize as Blanchard's um, model of what he calls situational leadership. And it develops, it's developed over some time. And really what it talks about is four basic um, worker types, so to speak, employee types that you're going to confront. And, not everyone is going to always fit into one of these boxes. It's like, a, it's like a disk analysis or a Myers-Briggs. It's not always exactly going to be perfectly accurate. You're going to have some folks that, that blend. And there's going to be some um, uh, daily things that even can occur or, or generational things, as we might talk about, that also blend into this uh, analysis. But what I wanted to kind of point out to everyone is there's four basic types of folks. And this is the, this is the person we love as a leader, right? This is the person that we can... Uh, count on being able, you know, they're, they're a high performer and they're willing and they're confident. That's a person that we can delegate things to confidently. Everybody loves that kind of an employee, right, because you can really count on them to do a great job. Then we move, we move to another, another quadrant of this analysis, though, and where you have an able follower, somebody that's good, they're skilled, they know what they're doing, but for whatever reason, they're either unwilling or unconfident. Now, those types of folks are going to need a different type of support. And in fact, that's, that's what it's called. It's more called, in Blanchard's terminology, it's called participation. You're kind of side by siding with them. You're encouraging them. You're moving them along. We'll move to the uh, other side of the analysis, which is the folks that are lacking in ability. Um, the selling style. These are folks that are unable, but they are willing. They have a great attitude. I see a couple of... Uh, Knowing glances here, we, we've seen this. And, and these are folks that really could benefit from, from true coaching and that we can push them along. And then we move to more of the un folks that are unable and they're also somewhat either unwilling or they're lacking in confidence. And this is what we would call our directive style. These people need the highest level of specific direction to be successful. Regardless of what style, I said in, at the outset, some other things can come into play too. And I think we're going to talk a little bit about some of the Possibly, maybe this will come up in questions based on some early feedback that, that, uh, that Dr. Juden was talking about, but uh, managing generational differences in the workplace. What does it mean if you're a traditionalist versus a baby boomer versus a Gen X person versus you know, the new Gen Y you know, generation that's moving into the workforce? What, what are all those differences and what do those look like and how do they form almost an overlay over this basic model that Blanchard has sort of put forward? But regardless of who they are or what they do, this is something I pulled off of one of another, another kind of classic um, management book, and that's why I'm sorry that I had to kind of photocopy, scan, and, and add to a slide in this manner. But what I'd like to, to, you to take away from this slide, and, and I'm calling this the performance coaching cycle. It doesn't matter where you fall in the quadrants. It doesn't matter what generation you're in. What I'll say is you need to be clear as a manager. And this is something I also learned. I learned situational leadership in the military. This is another thing I learned in the military. You have to be clear with your instructions. And, Clarity starts at the outset. You're reviewing plans, you're identifying goals, you're focusing on key activities, and you're developing a game plan and setting it in motion with all of your folks. The execution phase includes a lot of observation, providing feedback, adjusting, and recording as you go. Um, 
one of the things that seems to be lacking in a lot of organizations is this intermediate step. A lot of people are, do a good job at the outset of setting goals, but then they let it go, and at the end of the year, if the person was responsible for doing 65 whatever case studies or whatnot, and suddenly, with, with 11 months gone, they discover that only 11 have been completed. Well, that's, I'll submit to you, that's not a performance problem on the part of the employee. That's a supervisory managerial breakdown because someone somewhere along the way should have been looking at, as we'll talk about in a moment, reports, uh, metrics, something should have been telling them that there's, a, that there's a problem. Then at the end of the year, you ask for input. You get that good exchange with your employee. You review their records. You analyze performance activities in as hopefully as objective a manner as possible, and then you provide feedback. And of course, there's lots of places for feedback throughout the process, but the most important one is going to be your annual, where you really can close it out effectively with your employee. So moving ahead to what I'm doing with uh, human resources, when I arrived, the very first thing we focused on was this thing called the 10 points of alignment. There were some dissatisfiers, um, some different things that were going on in our uh, university where HR wasn't meeting the needs of the university. And quite frankly, there were some things, even within my own uh, team, uh, where, where, where there was some dissatisfaction on their part as, as both individuals and as an HR department. So what we focused on is basically you could think of this as a team charter. And if you don't have one of these for your department, I would encourage you to think about it. I did mine a little bit out of order, and I'll tell you why, but we'll, we'll keep moving. We then established a vision, a mission statement, and core values for our team. We wanted to be able to know, hey, if you see one of our folks in action wearing a KUMC human resources shirt or engaging in a human resources activity, we want people to be able to recognize us by conforming with the things that I've established and that are on our website and that we're holding ourselves out to do. Then came along my involvement you know, at, a, at a higher level here in the, a lot of the strategic planning initiatives that came forward you know, as part of Changing for Excellence and, and, our, and the creation of our strategic plan. And that allowed me to really plug in at a deeper level uh, from a human resources perspective and to devise a HR strategic plan and related action plans by which we could support Dr. Atkinson and the senior leadership team as we execute on our strategic plan. We've also then fit, completed a process, um, nearly complete, with a revision of our position descriptions to make sure that as I'm adding people to our team and we're adding capabilities and we're bringing in new skill sets that have never been here before, that we're making sure that we're covering the waterfront of all required activities. And then we are starting right now uh, the imposition of annual performance plans. This is somewhat of a corporate idea, but really what it is is it's taking all of the basic tasks that exist in a person's position description and operationalizing it with the use of data. What we're establishing for ourselves is a data dashboard with the help of enterprise analytics and my own team. Uh, we're establishing reports that are going to be built on traditional business measures, metrics, uh, key performance indicators, service level agreements. The reason is because I need to be clear with what I need from my folks. If you go back to our expectation setting slide, I need to tell them what we need to do to be successful. The numbers don't lie. That's how we're going to determine if we're doing a good job. And so what I'll be able to do is go to all of our key customers, regardless of what need is being met by the HR department, and find out what they need, how quickly they need it, what format, all of the details, and then in partnership with them, make sure that, that I understand their needs, and then we can deliver that. And that way, I can tell my boss, the Vice Chancellor of Administration, and the rest of the senior leadership team what it is that we're doing, and how it's meeting our customers' needs. And I can continue to measure it and monitor it as I go forward through the year. And then at the end of the year, as I reach that, that you know, last month of the performance year, I can kind of turn around and say, this is what we plan to do. This is what we delivered. And we've, we're actually proving a business case of how it is that we're, we're doing a good job for the organization. OK? What else? Um, business books. This is just a little bit of a tweak. I want to give everybody sort of on purpose. I'm just here to tell you as a newcomer, the, just as a simple fact of the matter, the US Armed Forces, you don't think of this as a, a bunch of folks that read business books. I'm telling you, they do. It's a leadership laboratory in people's lives, much like in, in, in our clinical operations can, in the operating room and other places. People's lives depend on good leadership. And the military is the same way. And by the way, private industry, they're kicking our butts too. We have got to take advantage of the tremendous resources as leaders that exist for us, if we take the time to learn 
If you haven't read some of these books or a million and one other ones that are out there, Good to Great, Radical Leap, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, Lincoln on Leadership, It's Your Ship is an excellent book as well. Take the time to start a, a, a reading plan for yourself. Um, there is a it's a treasure trove of information out there that's been developed, at Harvard Business Review, whatever it is that, that suits your needs, suits your purpose. And then if there are industry-specific books, like I've got a couple from my own field you know, in the HR world that I'm focused on as well. So there's plenty of stuff out there. A couple of final thoughts. Um, I'm probably the first person in a long time in the, in the history of talking about leadership to talk about Lao Tzu. I mean, but I, I really like this quote, um, the best leaders People don't even notice their existence. It's a little bit hard to wrap your, your mind around that. The next best level are those that are, uh, are, that are honored and praised. The, the next level down, people fear. And then the, the worst leaders are those that are hated. This goes back to situational leadership. You can't be overly directive right, to somebody that's a high performer, that you're really counting on to do a great job. Um, it's, just, it's just a basic application of the same principles, and it's, it's showing itself up. Even, even in this manner. And what you're doing is you're encouraging, you're bringing people along. And that's what, that's what Emerson talks about. Our chief want as individuals, as people, is, is to find someone who will inspire us to be what we know we can be. And the way to do that is, I believe, through situational leadership, through clarity of expectations, monitoring, and feedback, and then and just continuing to execute along a very consistent game plan. That's all I've got. Sounds good. Thanks, Chris. Very good. Thank you. Our next presenter is CJ Genevieve. Uh, CJ is the Director of Communications here at KU. Uh, she is a Nebraskan by birth who is a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley with an English degree. She has a master's degree from Boston University in creative writing. She is an accomplished journalist. Um, for those of you who may be new to Kansas City, she's been the editor, had been the editor of the Kansas City Alternative Magazine newspaper, The Pitch, for a number of years. She, at The Pitch, she won numerous awards for The Pitch and for her individual writing. Um, some of you may recognize her. She's an occasional pundit on KC Week in Review, Channel 19 show. She's shaking her head no. So she's the ringer here. She's been in groups before. So. Uh, with that, I welcome C.J. Genevieve. <clears throat> I think I'm hooked up, yeah. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Chris. Dr. Corntager, I'm looking forward to uh, what you have to say. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I hate doing this. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'll try to be really fast. Um, some of you, if you know the pitch, if you, if you ever read it, uh, or if you, especially if you didn't read it, you might just think that it's a um, tabloid magazine with a sex column in the back, which it is. And uh, here's just, you know, the standard sex, drugs, and rock and roll for you. I decided to put those on a slide so there's no, there's no um, confusion about what the pitch was. But, uh, which, okay. I did, so people often are confused by how I could have made this leap from the pitch to the University of Kansas Medical Center. And um, so, and apologize, a few of you I think have seen these slides before, so it's gonna be redundant, but I actually did write a, a science story during my time at the pitch. You can actually see my name here. This is about Joe Tash's uh, male birth control pill research. There was a story about uh, Kathleen Sebelius's this wasn't about KU Medical Center, but it was about healthcare, her efforts to um, reform healthcare in Kansas right before she was appointed um, HHS secretary. And I actually, I didn't write this story, but I, assi I uh, assigned it and edited it. All, the, all that happened before I got here, so I wasn't um, completely clueless about, you know, important non-sex drug and uh, sex drug and rock and roll issues. Um, <laughs> And also, I came from an academic family. My dad um, taught biology at the University of Nebraska. My mom was the curator of education at the University of Nebraska Art Museum. So um, it, it, university life is kind of in my DNA, and my parents complained about university life every night at the dinner table the entire time that I grew up. So I was somewhat prepared as to what to expect here. Um, 
the pitch was a competitor on a national level. We, um, we were routinely, uh, stories that we wrote were, were anthologized in the you know, best American writing series. Um, so even though we were a pretty small weekly paper in a pretty small town, we were, we were doing nationally recognized work. Um, and I was real proud of that. So my own work has appeared in the New York Times twice. First time was in 1990. Who wasn't born yet in 1990? Raise your hand. Okay, everyone was born then. Who remembers Roseanne Barr's version of the national anthem? Okay, so I wrote a um, essay arguing that it was high art and that the um, national political establishment should back off of Roseanne Barr, and um, and they published it. So that was the first time, and I was right out of grad school when that happened. The second time that my work has appeared in the New York Times was this past summer when uh, School of Medicine opened the Salina campus. And this is A.G. Sulzberger's byline, but I can take a lot of credit for this work because I worked with this reporter months ahead of the school's opening. I convinced him that this was a newsworthy story. I followed up as he... Um, made and then canceled interviews with people. Um, probably started talking with Arthur about, about this story in March. Um, and we saw the story in July. So, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim credit for that. Um, and um, so a couple of things about um, sort of what, what my job here is to, is my main job here is to get media coverage for the work that we're doing here at the Medical Center. And this is getting harder and harder by the moment. Um, these are just some stats. They're from uh, fall of 2010 about the state of the newspaper industry. They're not getting any better. We are, we, we are losing space in newspapers. We're losing reporters who care about what we, and, and are covering what we're doing. Um, uh, it's really bad out there, and on top of all that, um, um, most most Americans have no comprehension of what we actually do in a place like this. So it's doubly hard. We don't really have much media left to work with, and most of the readers don't understand really the the basics of a lot of what we do. So this is this is challenging. Um, we are nonetheless. Um, having successes, and the New York Times story was a good example of one. I've got some graphs that show media coverage going up. They're not in this slideshow, but we are getting more and more media coverage as you guys keep doing cooler and cooler more, you know, more things. Um, so we're just really sort of using new tools besides the tr traditional media. Um, we're still going to do news releases, but we're, doing, we're making better use of the web stories that we're running on KUMC.edu, and this is just an example of a story that we ran on our website uh, about some research that was going on here that we were then able to use that to pitch it to a story at the Kansas City Business Journal, and basically the same story showed up um, as a result of us having already sort of packaged it for whoever wanted to go find it there on our, on our web page. Um, you guys all getting KU today? Okay, that's good. So that's coming out of the Lawrence campus, but our stories are getting um, picked up there. Pretty much everything we have to, everything we, every time we put up a story on our website, it, it tends to show up in KU Today. Um, we're working with social media. We've got a Facebook page, a YouTube page, a Twitter feed, all that stuff. And um, Julie Adam, who's running a lot, a lot of that, is sitting here. And uh, yeah, at the risk of sounding like um, Donald Rumsfeld. There's many things that we haven't even th we don't even know that we know yet about how to how to do new things. Um, what's next? This is most of what I'm calling my action news team. Um, these are the uh, sort of official communicators here on campus. Not all of these folks report directly to me, so we've been building relationships with folks, and there are other. Um, there are other people I, I could and should add to this list, but um, we are, uh, all, all of these folks and others are really sort of wor working on ways to get more of those stories on the homepage and um, find out more about 
things that we don't know and, and get it into the, into the flow of information on this campus. Um, so um, our, our goal really is to take all of the information, take, take the stories. We want to tell stories about what's happening on this campus and tell them to the world. And um, there's a lot of great stories to tell here, but a lot of times when these stories start, they're really not in English. And um, this is what I would say one of our, this is our number one challenge is to figure out how, you know, when we talk about translation in our department, we are not talking about translational medicine. We are talking about translating what you guys are doing into eighth grade English that anyone can understand. And in order for us to be able to sort of think about this on our team, I've created a fiction, fictional character called the waitress in Abilene. I don't know why it's Abilene. I don't know why it's a waitress. Um, maybe just because I like this picture that I found Googling. But um, she's a Kansan. So part of our institution's mission is to improve her health and the health of her community. We've stated that that's what our mission is. And who knows what kind of connection she has to us beyond that. Maybe she has relatives who've been treated here. Maybe she has friends who are going to school here. I don't know. But she needs to understand what we're doing and why it's important to her. OK? And um, this is the name of a paper that was published here in a very high impact journal that uh, uh, this is amazing research. It has to do with um, the way oxygen can get into a placenta that can help make a healthy baby. Would that be kind of correct, Alyssa? I think that's about right. So we had to figure out, it, it, took, it took Alyssa Poe hours of meetings with researchers and then writing in, to, in order to get this into a story that we did run on our, on our homepage. And uh, I'm, leaving, I'm, I'm concluding with this slide really just to, uh, just to make, make two points really that um, we're always looking for great stories. We know how to turn them into stories that most, you know, that the general public will understand. But it takes a, we need a lot of help from all of you guys in a helping us hear, get these stories, helping us learn about them, but then also helping us tell them. And um, I look forward to working with more and more people all the time to get that done. Um, and I guess like that's the end of my slides. But um, in journalism world. It's so opposite of the world that Chris described. There's, there's, two, there's two sort of, it's, it's, a, it's an industry that can make a person crazy. And the reason is because there's, there's two extremes that happen, that, that happen at the same time. One of them is we are reacting moment by moment to whatever's happening in the outside world that we have absolutely no control over. So it's totally reactionary and and you have to always be ready to respond immediately. So meanwhile, you also know, in my, inst in my case, I had to get a paper out this week, next week, the week after that, the week after that. In daily journalism, it's even faster paced. So I had to plan far ahead at the same time as I, as I was reacting to what was happening today. And so you know, one, one way of, of, of managing that, that kind of life was just to always prepare for the worst, the absolute worst case scenario. Um, you know, in some cases it was like, you know, what if our story falls through for next week? In other cases it was like, what if, what if this murderer that we've just written about comes over to pay us a visit? Um, so, so I did a lot of, I did a lot of, um, planning for worst case scenarios, and what would I actually do if that thing happened, like I had it in my head. Here's plan A, plan B, plan C, and plan D. Um, and the good news is that most of the time, none of that stuff that was in my mind happened, but it was really real in my mind. So, um, so all of the sort of planning that, that you sort of suggested um, was very sort of seat of pants and imaginary in my world, but it, I kind of related to what you were talking about a little bit. So one other just like guiding principle that I like to use as, as a, uh, I guess, um, as a leader would be that um, when things are going well, it's always about you guys. When we have something big to do on our team, it's always we. 
and it's always we when, it, when it's going well and when we're having success. When things um, don't go well and there's a problem, it's me. So, you know, we when it's good, me when it's um, jacked up, and, and, uh, and I, 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 it's my job to take care of that stuff, and I'm not going to... I'm going to take full responsibility um, uh, in those cases. And the planning for the worst case scenario usually means that I don't have to do that very often, which is, which is a relief. So I'll, I'll stop there and uh, get the next guy up here. Very nice. Good, job. Good comments. I, um, I'm pleased to present our final presenter, Richard Korintager. Dr. Korintager is the chair of plastic surgery here at KU. He's also the program director of the residency program. He's director of the burn unit. Uh, he's also an undergraduate at McMaster's, McMaster's University in Canada. He completed his medical school and residency training at the University of Toronto and also his fellowship in Canada. He's had numerous leadership positions throughout his career. He's published nationally, he's presented nationally and internationally and published and co-authored a number of papers and I, um, I've had the opportunity to work with Richard the last few months in a small project, and I'm, I'm impressed with his, his passion and his enthusiasm for leadership and how he can take those leadership skills and motivate and nudge others to do a better job. So I'm really looking forward to his comments today. And with that, I present Dr. Richard Korintager. Very, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to sort of take a little bit different tact. You know, it's funny, plastic surgery is the most visual of all, I think, in essence, of the medical specialties, and so I have no slides. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do, I'm also going to go a little bit differently and take it from sort of a personal, a very personal level of where I started and where I've ended up here. You know, I'm the token Canadian up here. If you have trouble with my accent, that's where it comes from. Um, you know, if I think of leadership, I think of it as something that has ebbs and flows. I think that of it as something uh, where there are, in some ways, almost two kinds of leaders. You know, you've got, there's all the, the things that Chris was talking about that are sort of specific leadership styles. But I think, in some ways, I bring it down, and I think this comes from somewhat where I come from, there's reluctant leaders and then there's the leaders who are sort of focused and know that that's their direction and that's where they, where they want to go. And I sort of fall more into that reluctant sort of side um, and that'll become apparent as I sort of tell you a little bit how I've ended up standing up here. You know, if I look at my life, if I look at the things that I've done, there have been times when I've had leadership positions from you know, relatively early age. I think the youngest I can remember was being in charge of the Cub Scout troop. Um, you know, what exactly that involves and why you get that probably has to do with the snacks that your parents bring. But, you know, you, you've got that. You've got some school leadership. I think of some of the mentors that I've had along the way. One of the earliest leadership sort of discussions that I remember having was with a sensei, a, an instructor that I worked with when I was doing martial arts as a kid who said that it is the responsibility of every individual to be a leader and to teach the person who has less experience than they, than they do. And that's something that I sort of really emphasize these days. He said, you know, if this is your first day in class, then your second day you're going to be teaching the person who's, that's been their first day and it's your second day. So as I move along, I've sort of had these these various things. Um, one of the other elements, something that I'm always reminded of and, and tend to think about that I guess encourages me to believe that there's these ebbs and flows and that it's about the journey, not necessarily about the final place that you get to as a leader. When I was in first year medical school, we had a, um, or and it still goes on, there's a show called uh, Daffodil, which is a cabaret that's put on by the medical students. And uh, the very first one that I went to, there was a young lady who got up on stage. Most of the, most of the show was sort of these big singing and dancing um, events. And then this one, they just had this single young lady standing up on stage with a spotlight on her, standing with a microphone. And she said, 
you know, when I was in kindergarten, I thought if I could only get through to first grade, I'd be over the hump and it'd be clear sailing. And then when I was in sixth grade, if I could only get into grade seven, into junior high school, I'd be over the hump. And you know, you see where this is going. She kept going, and then finally she said, who keeps moving the hump? And in many ways, that's a guiding principle when I think of leadership, because the hump keeps moving. I moved to Kansas City in uh, 99, and I ended up spending a couple of years at KU three years here, and then went back into private practice where I'd been um, all of my, my professional life. And then at the request and insistence of Irene Cummings, uh, she encouraged me and uh, Dr. Jim Thomas encouraged me to come back and take over and direct the burn unit again. And that's one of the reasons that I sort of looked at myself and think of myself somewhat as a reluctant leader. I thoroughly enjoy it. It's the most exciting thing that I do in many ways, but it wasn't something that I honestly went searching for. And then as I went along and as I discovered what needed to be done to fix things, to improve areas where I thought we needed improvement, that hump kept moving along. And then the next thing that came up, Dr. Atkinson asked me if I would be willing to take over uh, as program director the plastic surgery residency program, which I immediately declined. And she said, okay, well, you have a choice. You know, you can either take this, and I believe you can do this, or we can find somebody else and it will be their vision and not yours. And that statement was really the thing from a leadership point of view. That was the stick that she poked at me that encouraged me to be willing to take on that role. And then about six months later, she said, so what do you need to make the plastic surgery group successful? And I gave her a list of thoughts and ideas, and she said, okay, do it. I said, no, you know, I'm, I'm not primarily an academic. I never thought about being an academic. I've never thought about being in charge of a large group or any group like that. And she used the same argument. You can either make it your own or we can find somebody else and you will have to be within their vision of what this will be. Long story short, I agreed. And that was one week before um, that was one week before my second child was born, much to my wife's uh, <laughs> interest. Um, so, the leadership in in my mind, taking on leadership roles, sometimes it's something that you do with a very conscious effort. You know, we look at our presidential candidates, and they are very consciously saying, we want to be the leader. We know better than everybody else. I think there are others of us who take on leadership roles, somewhat because it's thrust upon you, somewhat because you have a vision, you've got an idea of where you think things can go, and there just don't happen to be others around you who can take that over. Couple, just made a couple quick little notes, and then I'm going to stop so that we have some time for questions. If I think of the things that I've learned in the three years since I've taken over as director of the plastic surgery group and as um, uh, the residency program, the most important things, listen to your gut. Do what you believe is right. And if you're honest and you can look yourself in the mirror after you've made a, dis a decision, then you've probably made the right decision or probably made the best decision. Flexibility has been absolutely critical. We've gone from a group of basically two plastic surgeons to we'll be at 10 this summer. And that has taken a tremendous amount of flexibility and understanding different aspects and being willing to admit when you don't know something as a leader. That isn't a sign of weakness, it's a sign of, I think, understanding how complex many of these, these problems are. The generational differences that Chris alluded to, we spent some time on, was it Wednesday night or Wednesday night, um, going over this. The generational differences, I have a three and a six-year-old, so I'm well aware of generational differences. 
but the generational differences, which I think we would be great if we talk about, these groups have been truncated to use uh, Dr. Klein's words at our meeting. They, you know, these generations are truncated. It's becoming more and more difficult as a leader to know how do you deal with all these different groups. And the final thing I want to say is that when it comes to being a leader, um, it's really tiring. You know, it, you're making a big commitment. And whether you're being a leader at a, at a level of an athletic team or a small group or a large group or a big organization, if you're serious about being a leader, you're going to take that job very seriously and it's going to be very tiring. And I think leadership has, again, it's got an ebb and a flow and it's got a beginning and it has an end. And I think you have to recognize as a leader that if you want to develop people, I think of the plastic surgeons that I brought on to my group. You know, um, some of the people here know the people that I brought on. I've got people who are Harvard graduates. It, it's craziness. These are incredibly um, competent individuals who will in their own want, right want leadership positions. And if as the leader I don't recognize that there's a point at which I have to give them the opportunity to step forward, then I think that I've failed as in part of my, my leadership responsibilities. So those are just some general thoughts and I think we're now just going to take questions and see where it goes from here. Please, who has some questions? Uh, nice. <coughs> Help us out. Questions? <laughs> Please. Questions have to be on microphones. So hold on one second. Adobe Connect again. So how do you really generate enthusiasm in your group so people want to work hard? Sort of the difference between the carrot and stick, I mean, so that you're not yelling at people all the time to do work harder, people are wanting to. Sure, I can try to start. I think <clears throat> going back to my situational leadership model, every person has their own issues. They have their own hot buttons, and um, so that's something to be conscious of. E each individual's needs, what their interests are. Um, another thing, though, and it really starts with vision. Um, you have to cast a vision for what you think, you know, each person in your team and, and your department as a whole are capable of doing, especially if you can shoulder it up, up against um, the, a strategic vision like we have, a strategic plan like we have for our organization, and um, show people what it is that they can do, how they fit in, what the impact is going to be on the organization, how they're going to grow from that, and sort of what's in it what's in it for them. Um, if you ultimately find that you can't motivate someone, inspire them to, to greater heights and greater action, um, I'm going to give you another thing that maybe a lot of people don't talk about you know, from an HR perspective historically here, but you may have the wrong folks. And because uh, there's only so far a leader can, can take it. And so that's something else to be, to be conscious of. Let me ask, is there specific comments or ways that you motivate your folks as you're working long hours on a story, you're 75, 80 hours a week in the OR with people? Is there certain little inside strategies you guys use? You know, I think the thing that I use, uh, and I think that was actually just brilliant, that answer, because I think that's absolutely the key thing. People will only work hard for you if they believe in your strategic vision overall and they understand that they have a critical part in it. When I'm thinking of individual people, you know, surgeons aren't always the greatest at taking direction. Um, and what I find I have to do is I look at the people and I don't try to put, you know, a round peg in a square hole. I recognize that the people are different, that they're going to have different things that are going to turn them on. I've got some surgeons who I know that if I tell them, look, if we do this, then your revenue is going to increase and you're going to take more money home at the end of the month, they'll do anything I want. If I, I've got other surgeons who I say, you know what, this is going to give you more free time and this is going to, or this is going to allow you to, your research to be more effective. 
so it, it's really on a very individual basis. The biggest challenge that I find right at the moment goes back to the generational. I've got, you know, we have a six-year training program in plastic surgery. And the way we train what, what stimulates what gets people excited, um, the first-year residents versus the six-year residents is very different. And you, I think you really have to understand uh, if you want to engage people, you have to understand what engages them. Uh, you know, we, we heard CJ was talking about Twitter feeds and, you know, the, the various things. You know, if you're trying to engage somebody or get them to do a job with a technology that, that they don't understand, that isn't comfortable to them, then it's not going to work out well. You know, they're not going to get excited. They're not going to want to do it. But you turn somebody else on w with that same thing. So you just, I think you have to recognize what you're, who you're dealing with. How do they do it in communication, in journalism, when you're, how do you motivate somebody to work hours and hours on a story and edit and edit and? That's a certain mindset that draws people to the field. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I would just say the same thing that these guys have been saying in, in, a, in a different way, which is, uh, you know, find what someone really is really good at and really enjoys doing and turn them loose. You know, let them create their own reality and let it succeed and give it lots of love and nourishment and, and praise and, and love that. Love and nourishment? Love, okay, re, that's a little redundant, but. Um, no, 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 I like it, I like it. That's why I say love, how do we, you know. So, I mean, I just, I just look for, for where those strong points are and try and encourage them and, you know, to, to, to Reemphasize what these guys both said is if someone's not doing their job, then that's their own. That's another kind of misery that is that person's misery and the misery of everyone around them, and, and my misery also. And, and those situations need to be fixed. So, if someone isn't doing their job, how do we go about addressing that as leaders? How do we do that? How do it's one of the toughest things I, ha I think that happens as a leader. How do you talk to somebody who's underperforming? You know. I think that's absolutely a question. It's, it's so important because one of the hardest things for me in coming into this position was I hate conflict with people. You know, I hate telling somebody, you're not doing a good job, a resident, you're not up to par. Uh, and the way I've dealt with it is by, I guess, having, that bi having a bigger vision and trying to really stick with that and just you know, steal myself up that if I have to go tell somebody that they're not doing a great job, um, I've got to do it because it's, it's sort of for the good of everything. And the only thing that happens if you don't, if you try to sweep it under the cover, you try to pretend, then it just gets worse, it festers, and then the whole organization starts to fall apart. So, you know, I think, um, you know, Chris is right that, it, you know, if you're going to take somebody out of a position, if you're going to remove them from a position, what I'll always try to do, you know, first is see, do we just have them in the wrong position? Do they, are they basically a good worker, a good person who could be very successful in a certain, in, in something else? So if we can move people around, and we've done that a lot with our, with our nursing. Again, you know, when you're talking about surgeons, we're very particular, but in an, very different ways. So I've had some nurses who it's just oil and water with one surgeon that, you know, we sit down with them. What are the things that bother you? Oh, well, you know what? They'll maybe work better with this one. So that's one way you can go. But there's also been times where if somebody steps over the line, if they're, they're not being productive, they're not helping, then you just have to say, this isn't a good fit. How about you, Chris? How does that I think that's really good. And just to expound on that here, you know, at, at our institution, just a quick plug for our HR Employee Service Center. We have reconfigured the way we deliver HR services here. And um, anyone, um, supervisor, manager in the audience that needs help, um, feel free for your fir very first thing to do to contact us at the HR Service Center. It's 1044 DELP. Um, Center is led by Adrian Fitzmaurice, my newest HR director, and we are really priding ourselves on turning into a function that primarily in the past was probably more focused on good HR administration and that sort of a thing. We're really moving into a more of an internal consulting model to help supervisors and managers get the results that they need. 
So whether you're dealing with a conduct issue or a performance issue, um, we're, really, we're really priding ourselves on every single interaction we have with our leaders to try to make it as, as good as possible and to get you to the spot where you need to be with your employees. And, and I really uh, want to emphasize um, that the notion that it is important to look and see if, if, about being placed in the right uh, spot. Um, the very first book I mentioned is, was Good to Great, and for those that have read it have heard the famous you know, metaphor about getting the right people on the bus. That's the first step, and then, and then getting them into the right seat, because that, that does happen. And, um, and you know, time, promotions, and, and different decisions occur. Sometimes people just get in the wrong, the wrong situation, and we can really work creatively to try to get something done for your benefit, uh, for your departments. Questions? Please. Okay. Go, Bob. Compared to other organizations where I've uh, worked, it seems that here the resources um, and the culture for developing the next generation of leaders is a little thin. And um, in succession planning, um, I think, is starting to get some traction here, some, some interest. And I'm wondering from your individual careers, um, how you've approached developing the next generation of leaders? Um, I can go first, and I can talk. I can put it into context with what we're trying to do here. One of the many things that I'm very grateful to my, you know, manager for Stephanie Webb, our vice chancellor of administration, is a is a real push into the area of training and development. And we are expanding our team. Um, we are looking for a training director to grow a function that will do exactly what you're talking about, Priscilla, which is to, to grow and develop our next sort of generation of leaders and to really provide them a comprehensive curriculum on all of the different things that you'd expect, you know, leaders in an organization like ours with a variety of responsibilities and, and sometimes legal obligations to, to get it right. Um, that is pretty much, um, I think, speaking more broadly, a best practice approach for most organizations. The better the organization, usually it can be correlated back with how much they are training and developing their own employees, whether internally or through external sources. And to talk about AOL for a moment, even down to the smallest organizations that we had out in the field at some of our call centers, we had incredibly strong management teams. And it's because we invested so much time and energy in getting them uh, onboarded with a very comprehensive way of managing people so that all leaders fit into the same model. We all spoke with the same words. We used the same actions. And we could, we could consistently, both horizontally and vertically, manage employees you know, very, very efficiently and effectively for, the, for their development and for the development and the, the productivity and the efficiency of the organization. So I think from a corporate perspective, that's, that's where we are headed to try to really develop a real leadership core uh, here in the, or in the organization. Also, I think the School of Medicine, School of Nursing, and Graduate Medical Education is making more of an effort to integrate programs. Karen Miller, would you, you want to say anything about that? people can learn um, skills for leadership. But the other thing I would say is our place here, and I think CJ alluded to this, is filled with really very talented, uh, well-educated, um, a variety of diverse, competent people for the most part. Um, and we all have a role to play. So I think there are lots of different ways. I think, Priscilla, you make a good point. I think we could be stronger in developing um, the next generation, although in some ways we do that through chairmanships and through department, and if you're looking at straight managerial kinds of things. But our place has a lot of opportunity for leadership that is not in line authority kinds of positions because of the nature of our place. We have science uh, experts, we have clinical experts, we have teaching experts, all those kinds of areas need leadership and really strong staff support for what we do. So it's a multifaceted issue here, but I think we should realize that we are a really special place with lots of really talented people to begin with. It takes Thank all of us to make this work. Thank you. You know, I just add that um, I think that one of the things that I've noticed here over the past 
five or six years is that there's been closer alignment um, between School of Medicine, School of Nursing, University of Kansas Physicians, the hospital. You know, the hospital is running a, uh, a leadership program that I've just am just about completed with. Um, so I think that as those those alignments sort of strengthen, I think we'll see more of that. I think what you were talking about secession planning, and I think that is a real weakness. Um, certainly, if you look in terms of uh, chairs of departments, not just here, but I think you know most places around this country, um, very often there is a lack of secession planning. We had a presentation not too long ago that showed at a major university when the chair of surgery, two chairs of surgery at two major universities both stepped down at basically the same time, one as a result of illness, one as a result of something else. And uh, the one where there was a very distinct secession plan, the group just cruised right along. You know, their reputation, their numbers, everything just cruised right along. The other group, it took a couple of years before they got somebody into that position and it just devastated, you know, their, their program. So I think that's very important. Where I was in Toronto, at the University of Toronto, uh, in most of the departments, uh, and plastic surgery was like this, you had, as chair, you had five years, and if people wanted you to stay and you wanted to stay for another five years, you stayed. But at 10 years, somebody else took over. Because I think it's, I think there's a degree of arrogance if we feel that no matter how good you are as a leader, if you feel that there's nobody else who can approach that, I just, I just don't really believe in that. So I, I think that that secession planning is really important. Some final comments, CJ? Well, I would like to say um, two things about what makes these guys such great leaders from just my, my, okay, my opinion. Um, first of all, I love it that our head of HR always wears jeans and our <laughs> never wears a tie. And, um, and Dr. Korntager is, you know, you're, you're in charge of a department, but you're super easy to talk to and you always answer your emails really quickly. So. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Chris? I don't know how to top that. <laughs> Richard? I get to wear scrubs. I don't know. <laughs> Listen, you know, the funny thing, though, you know, she mentions about wearing jeans, and it just goes back, and maybe I could just sort of bring us back to that sort of Please. the generational discussion of, of leadership. Um, one of the reasons that I'll at times wear a tie is that when I'm in the office, I know that patients over a certain age are much more comfortable if I'm dressed in a certain way. And I, in fact, I, we've just gone through our resident um, evaluations, our six-month evaluations, and one of the things I told all of our juniors is that you need to start looking like a plastic surgeon. You know, you need to, as a leader, you also need to look at the group that you're working, the group that you're standing in front of, and you need to make sure that you're presenting the, you know, the, the look, the feel that you need. And what HR needs to present, what journalism needs to present are, are different. And I think that you, you, know, you need to recognize that. And that's a real challenge as we look generationally. Um, that's the single biggest problem. We spent a lot of time on this the other night. And I take any suggestions that anybody has. but. We're in such, it's so truncated. When I went through my residency, it was, it was very easy for our attendings to tell us this is the way you need to be because we were sort of at the tail end of the baby boom generation and there was, you know, 20 years where everybody sort of essentially thought and acted somewhat alike. You sort of knew what you were getting. Now I find the way I have to talk to the way these guys have to present and ladies have to present themselves, um, it's, it's just so different from year to year. The generations seem to be changing almost that quickly these days. Listen, we're, we should probably stop here, but listen, thank you for your attention and thank our presenters for their nice comments. <laughs>